All right, am I working? Cool. Everyone else will have to straggle in. We'll go with who we got. That way we won't keep you too long. <clears throat> Especially with five or six of us, we can probably do this in an hour. <laughs> and we'll just keep moving forward. Um, tonight, oh, you already did it. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about home ownership. And uh, we've covered code enforcement and vacant property and all this other stuff. One of the things that happened uh, during the recession, which hit uh, especially Middletown hard, was you know it, there was a period uh, through the 80s and 90s where everybody should own a home. And we gave a lot of bad loans out. And then when this bubble burst, Middletown took a hit worse than most uh, because our people were probably better, worse positioned to weather the storm. And so uh, this is back now to does home ownership still matter after the recession? I know that as the recession was ending, as I was talking to people, there was a group of millennials that said, we don't care about owning a home. There was also a whole group of people who got burned during the recession who said, I'll never own a home again, even if I can. And so how does that work moving forward coming out of the recession? So go ahead, please. And so again, as before, I'm gonna spend three minutes and we'll go right on through it. but. Uh, and this is a really nice thing that Dantra did for us, but as we go through our lives, almost all of us go through the same style of housing. And even if we start down here and we end up at a million dollars, we end here, we end up at $70,000, it's roughly the same process. And the process is you move out of your parents' house into your first crappy apartment, then you get a little bit of money and you get into a better apartment, and then you finally get your first home, and then you have kids and you get a bigger home, and at some point the kids get done and you become empty nesters. And at some point you're eventually, whatever you're gonna live in as a senior, uh, you downsize again to whatever it is. So you kind of go on that bell curve where you're getting bigger, 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 smaller, 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 smaller. Most of us do something like that. Uh, and whether, again, whether your crappy apartment's really crappy or your crappy apartment's what the Chinese can afford coming over at mom, two different things. But it's the same style that most of us go through. So go ahead, please. And so the idea for us if in Middletown, from my point of view, is can I create a balanced housing stock over time in the city so that no matter where you are in the housing cycle and no matter how much money you're making, when you're ready to move up or you're ready to move down, I have a number of places for you to look at that you go, well, I like me living in Middletown and I've got all these choices. Certainly I can find one I want to live. Because what happens now is we've got about 70% of our homes, our starter homes are under $100,000. And what happens is when you hit that top of the thing, when you need that bigger home, the nicer home, and your wife's working, and you got some money, you have to leave Middletown and go somewhere else because we don't have the bigger housing in our stock to handle you. And so you end up in Mason and Lakota and Springboro. And the minute that you're making good money and we want your income tax, most of you have to leave because there's no housing available. And so that the question is over time through this process, through the things we do over the next five to 10 years, how can we better position ourselves to be more competitive so that again, if you like living here, you can ride that thing up, ride that thing down. There are senior options, there's big options, there's small options, there's apartments, there's good apartments, there's less good apartments, all of it is available. And with a wide variety that you just go, wow, I can stay here and enjoy living in Middletown. Go ahead. So the question is, uh, the first one is, how do we compare to the area? Our home ownership is at 52.6%. This is the 2016 census data. Uh, it just came out about a month ago. Uh, if you take us out of Butler County, pull Middletown's numbers out, the rest of Butler County is at 71.5% home ownership, which is very high. Uh, Ohio is at 66%. The United States, 63.6%. But even if you look at the rest of Ohio, I mean, we're down 13, 14% less homeowners, more renters than the surrounding area. We're way out of whack with Butler County, but I'm not sure I, that's kind of skewed. I'm more, more worried about Ohio than I am the rest of Butler County. So go ahead. What does that mean number wise? If you take that and you use Ohio at 66% and you said, let's flip the number of units we have in Middletown and redistribute that 52 and make it 66%, what has to change? And the answer is 2,600 have to go from renter to home ownership 
to get us back up to 66%. So, I mean, there's 2,600 housing units that would have to change hands from renters to owners just to get us back up to look what like the rest of Ohio does. And so that's, you know, over time it could be done, but it's a big number. Go ahead. Second question is, does home ownership stabilize neighborhoods? And I'll tell you the data, and I think I sent these out. If I didn't, I will. But I thought I sent them out earlier. Hi. And the answer is maybe. Uh, the, the one at the top, I'm not going to read it, and especially if you've read the article, says, we consistently find that home ownership significantly reduces criminal activity. The second one said, yeah, our, our data didn't show that. Our data shows that people try to move to low-income neighbor or low-crime neighborhoods and that ownership in itself has nothing to do with criminal activity. The participation of the neighbors in the neighborhood is what drives criminal activity up or down uh, or lack thereof of participation. And so the answer is, does homeownership stabilize neighborhoods? Maybe. Uh, anecdotally, I mean, as we sit and talk about it, it makes sense. But is it real? The, the, I will tell you, the data is mixed. And so it's something we'll have to give some thought to in our neighborhoods. Go ahead, please. So knowing that the homeownership may or may not reduce crime, may or may not cause some good things for us, the question is, should Middletown be setting a home ownership goal? And if so, what should that be? Uh, we know our rentals are significantly higher. We're going to talk about that at the next meeting. And so is there an actual number that we should strive for? Because again, as we set up our housing policy and then we go into certain neighborhoods, we will start talking about, well, remember, we're trying to do this, looking at these houses that are vacant, look at these houses, these empty lots, looking at these tax delinquent properties. How are we gonna apply our neighborhood redevelopment to work on whatever goal we do or don't set here? And so the question becomes, does homeownership still matter in Middletown given the changes in the recession? And that may be a good question for you. What are you seeing as, as a realtor? I mean, are, is homeownership still what everybody aspires to? Is, are people still buying homes? That's are they, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it tends to, I think, base people here. I do agree with that. I think we have a very transient population right now. They're much more fluid if they're renting. Yeah, with 48% rentals, you're, and, and people are moving often every year to a different rental. You're, I know the schools are having trouble with it because you're in this school this year, they're in this school this year, you're in this school this year, and it's hard for the kids to get the continuity. It's hard for the teachers to pass along, hey, Timmy has a problem with that. Well, Timmy's now across town. I don't even know the teacher over there. Mm -hmm. and 142 that went out. out. So that's still 300 in a school that is not supposed to have 600 students. Yeah, staggering. You know, and we worry about our schools, and you know, I think Marlon's doing a great job trying to turn that around, but we're, I think we're giving him a lot of challenges that maybe he doesn't need to have a, later on in life if we can figure out how to handle this better. So I guess the question, what do you think about homeownership? I mean, should it, should it be more? Should we have less rentals? And if so, do we emulate Ohio, the U.S., something else? Because we could always set a goal to start and five years down the road go, well, you know, we did pretty good on that. Let's, let's move a little further down the road. So I guess I'm asking you, what do you as a group think about homeownership in Middletown? Because, again, we know we've got vacant lots. We've got a lot of things to work with. If we know what we're trying to do, then as we put these things together, we'll, we'll – put those tools in play in a way that effectuates whatever it is we're trying to do. Just another education related thing that yes. uh, has, has to do with when we look at how our school system is rated, which then talks about people wanting to move in or people being willing to stay, et cetera, mm -hmm. our, our improvement with those students who, don't, who aren't in that transient category is significant. Many of our students are, on, are pretty close to on point or on assessment levels that are appropriate, yeah. it's those students who have, but I mean, that's 50%. Right. So it, I think that it's going to be important for us to help have some kind of a stabilization target. Or, or and, and I think what you're saying is exactly right. If you have 
150 come in and you make a little bit of progress and then you bring a new 150 in, you gotta start all over and make a little bit of progress, bring 150 in then the third year, you can see where Marlin's gonna struggle. And, and a lot of it has to do with our housing. I mean, we, we contribute to that, I think. So home ownership, what does, what does that look like? What, what should it look like? The six of you, five, yeah, six of you get to, half the people aren't here, so you get to help me decide. <laughs> Certainly a, a strategy that would work, you know, hit the first one, yeah, move on to the second one. 71%, um, that's, str that's strong. I mean, I, I would be awesome, but I'm not, I don't know, maybe 15 years down the road, but were you gonna? No, I'm, I'm, I'm in that boat with people that, you know, had to start a home, jumping to another, like I'm with someone now, we have our income, you know, we're together and we're shopping. Yeah. You know, what, what we like. And it's like for me to even get to the type of property that I would like to have, which is, or what she would like to have, which mm -hmm. is, I don't mind an investment, but she wants new build. <laughs> that's what, uh, that's what we're right. <laughs> yeah. But no, you're right. And, and I can tell you my, my story is when I came to, to Middletown as city manager, I had to move here, which was fine. I moved from Mason. And I told, you know, I have to say, at the time I have six kids. I have 12, no, I have nine grandchildren now. And so I told council, I said, I can't just go grab a four bedroom house. I need to find a house that works for my family so that if little things like we're gonna have a cookout on Saturday, there's enough room for people to go. I need a big living room and I need some kind of a yard that you know just will handle 20 people because that's what I got if everybody comes with their spouses and their boyfriends and girlfriends and all the kids and grandkids. And so I started looking I had a terrible time. I had to go back to council and say, I need another three months. And I said, I, I promise we're working on it. I've been through like 50 houses, but they're not configured right. They're from 1980s, they haven't been updated. There's, I mean, there was always something that just was not good. And then I found the house that I bought and it worked out great, but it took me. That's exactly right. And that's what I was finding. I love the house, but I'm gonna have to put 50,000 into it just to make it nice again. You know, we had pink bathtubs and toilets, and I mean, <laughs> just like, wow, that's ugly. That's Pepto Bismol pink. But, right. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm down off of Rosedale, and so there's some nice stuff here and there. And I found one that had already been renovated and it was big and it had a nice living room and it had a great big back deck and it's like, yeah, he finally found one. But it took us seven months, eight months of, and it was literally every time something, hey, a new one just came on the market, let's get over there before somebody buys it. Because yeah, I, but those are the problems that we're, we're facing right now uh, live here, so. We ran into a situation too where the younger kids don't want to start with a no. beginner house. They, they do not. They what their parents have. Uh -huh. Which is, from there. yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, still, okay. There's still a market out there for. There absolutely is. Yeah. We have some really cool older houses. And what I'm seeing versus, you know, what Dan is seeing is that, you know, I have people come to me that's older who's wanting small. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, you know, the, but the newer, the younger people are wanting the Renaissance, the, uh, uh, out there where your brother live at, you know what I mean? They, they're wanting, they're wanting those caliber, and you know, then the older homes, nobody really want them because they're in historical, regulated. You know what I'm saying? You know, so there's, um, you know, I think, I think like you're saying, it's a trend where, you know, when you're younger, you want this, but then when you get older, you want to downsize. Right and less maintenance, and you, you just have different needs. Wow. Different needs that you want in your life at that different time, so. But is it realistic to, I mean, I like 63.6%, mm -hmm. but what are we talking about? I mean, as far as a time frame, because that's more than, I mean, it's 
obviously more than 10% uh, of where we currently are. Right. Which is kind of a usual, a usual benchmark. Yep. 10 to 15% growth in some, some time. I mean, so, so yes, we have to increase the, the home ownership. That's just one aspect of it. But I agree. We also have to talk about, and I know that's not on the slide, yeah. getting some people invested in being members of the community. I agree. I agree, and that that probably is more important than necessarily home ownership. But home ownership certainly, ownership. it's home ownership certainly gives you a reason to get in the game. And and for and if we could be really creative, and this is like my well, juice for the high. You do your thing, and then I'll give you my creative because so, it's on the next you know, slide. If we could be really creative, then perhaps some of our because there was a time when people it didn't matter whether you were a renter or an owner. Right. You were invested in the community, in your property, the things like um, keep Middletown beautiful or the little right. neighborhood competitions, all of that stuff existed, mm -hmm. uh, especially in certain areas that deemed themselves communities. And I don't know how we, that may be something we can never get back, but I don't like to use the word never. No. Uh, but it, on some different level, we're going to have to, uh, because we're still going to have a high percentage of people who are renting for the next 20 years. I agree. I agree. I think a lot of people rent because, you know, also they, they don't know. I mean, they're ignorant in terms of home ownership, what it takes. You know, I mean, I have a lot of people, we're not educating the people that, hey, you can qualify. I had a lady who, she was like, well, I'm, I'm afraid. She didn't know. She didn't know about first time home buyer money. She didn't know about grant money. She didn't know about these things that are in place for home ownership. Then we got. Then we got to teach you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Doug. But that's the, that's one piece. But we've got such a large population of of individuals, and this really, as, as that liberal person who, who works with family poverty. But how about teaching the maintenance piece? That's exactly what I was getting ready to say. After we teach them how to get the home, they have to be able to maintain it. If if you're not working on your home. It's going downhill. It's just that simple. Have home repairs and those sorts of classes. Home, mm -hmm. home, shop. Ec. home ec and shop. Yep. Yeah, wood shop. Exactly. But we, but with, so we can't bash the common core because it doesn't do us any good. We're, we're not in a position to change that right. right now. But the opportunity to teach that skill set somehow. Well, I can tell you one of the things, and we'll get to that next slide, but one of the things, if we're going to do some things with down payment assistance, you have to go through a five week oh, class. Right. You have to go through a five-week class to understand financing. You have to go through, you know, two weeks of financing, three weeks of maintenance, and then you're eligible for the money. I mean, those are those are the types of things we can do. They, they programs we can design them any way we want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That existed when I purchased my house. My son sat through the county had to take a course, and they did down payment assistance yeah. for me to move into that house. And it wasn't small; it was significant enough to help me get in that home. That home. We should incorporate that into what, whatever we're going to do that's as we're getting. Be, that's got to be strong, mm -hmm. almost in the sense of perhaps it's not a full-time person, but it's got to be someone to continue to, to be available to work with people when they begin to slip. Yeah. We, we, all, we go from crisis to crisis. Now that they've made a mess of it, that's exactly right. now we're trying to, we have to take dark, you know, gigantic efforts. Uh, you know, it's like, do you have to get the whole disconnect notice before you're eligible? We have to change that mentality mm -hmm. so that we could yeah. not be so late. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a smart way to look at this. And again, it's our policy. We can do it any way we want to do it. So the answer is we're willing to help you. you got to set yourself up at least the best we can to make you have a chance of being successful. And those should be in the terms. Just like I agree. if you leave your house within five years when you get certain kinds of assistance and this is what... Is, but so mm -hmm. not just that piece, yeah. but the, the thinking piece to help you be proactive and, and to do preventative things and, yeah. and to not make, well, we can't stop you from making really stupid decisions. Yeah, I can't. At least to talk about. Screen you as, as effectively as we can reasonably without, without being completely. Punitive, right. Keep people engaged. Right. I agree. 
And I, I agree with that too, but Marlon's got so darn many, un, yeah, Marlon's got so darn many unfunded mandates that he's supposed to be doing on all these different things. He's like, I'm trying to get your test scores up and I'm supposed to be teaching home finance and all this other stuff. He goes, I, there's, I, I, you know, I think he's visionary, but there's only so many hours in the day. And, and Uh, our top right. 10 or maybe our, our, our top 25 percent, they get involved in these kind of projects. Yeah. But some of those students who we know are probably going to leave high school and stay in the Middletown area and not even take that time for college, those students are less likely to participate in the way we currently have school. Yeah. Is, is the I agree. I agree. Go ahead and bump us forward. So. These are the things that came off the top of my head. Um, home ownership. I can tell you that we are 95% of the way uh, with Ryan Homes to restart Sawyer Mill. They're gonna build around 160 homes in the next four years. There are 150 to 230 each. Uh, and they'll, of course, all be homeowners. So again, if we're here and we're adding homeowners, obviously we're, we're helping our percentage. Second one is we've talked about like our buffer. If we go into our buffer area and we say go around AK here and we know it's 70% rental in that area, then every time we knock down 10 homes, an average of seven of them, <clears throat> excuse me, are gonna be rentals, three are gonna be homeowners. It's going to reduce our number of rentals in some way. Uh, vacant houses, we've talked about before. Fill them, do the land bank program where you seize them, use Dickey to pick them back up and put them back together, get a Milltown Realtor and uh, sell them to a homeowner. Again, that helps us do our thing. Um, down payment assistance, we've got now, it'll probably change as we start figuring out what it is we're trying to do. We, we can add that component to it, but we can also, one of the cool things, and I'm gonna go through what some other places are doing right now. Um, a lot of them are targeting to a certain type of housing that they're trying to fill in a neighborhood or they're doing it to a certain type of person they would like to get to move to the city. Um, I know Marlon would love to get more of his teachers to live in Middletown and understand their community instead of driving in from Mason, getting off the highway, going to school, going back to Mason. And so he would love to see a program where teachers could get an, an, an enhanced down payment of some kind. Um, same thing with city employees. Uh, the hospital, I've seen hospital programs where you're trying to get nurses or there's a nurse shortage. Well, you come to Middletown as a nurse and we're gonna give you some incentive to buy, buy a place here and live here. Um, Paducah and uh, a couple other places have done artist work where you kind of a work, work studio type places. They develop those in certain parts of town and they give really nice incentives to come in and move your studio in here and there's a bedroom back there and you can be all artsy and it's just awesome. Those are things you're doing. Uh, Hamilton, about six months ago, uh, started a program where they are trying to recruit college graduates to get their education level up of their residency. And so if you're a recent college graduate, you can get some kind of an incentive to get a house because they want you to move into the city. Uh, how about an incentive to relocate? Uh, we've, how about for workforce development? Let's say AK needs 10 engineers and they're having trouble getting them. What if we could do something with housing that if you, you know, you have four engineering jobs you can choose from, but if you go with AK, we're gonna put $20,000 towards a house for you. You should come here and we can help our AK, we can help Atrium, we can help our manufacturers fill things again on some logical basis that if you're having a particular skill set that you're having trouble getting to come to Middletown, maybe there's something we can do to help in that. Um, Lease to own program, uh, it's been done in a lot of places. I, I think it would have limited, we'd have to talk about how we would use that and whether we'd wanna use it, but there are programs out there for people who have lost their home in the recession. This was even more five years ago, and the idea would be, I, I got my job back, I'm doing great, but I have a foreclosure and I'm, my credit's torqued. And so what you do is you work with like a neighborhood housing service or a lifespan or somebody like that, and you rent, this house that you're gonna buy for four years and part of your rent goes towards a down payment. You have four years of payment history of good rent. You go to classes as part of the, those programs were part of that. 
And the idea is at the end of that time, you now qualify with the bank to use the you know, $200 a month that we took out of your rent, plus your education, plus now you've helped your credit for four years of payments. Now you're qualified, you can buy the house that you've been living in. Those are out there. Uh, land cooperative, this was something, if you ever get bored, look up the Cincinnati Land Cooperative, uh, Google it. There is a program in Cincinnati, and this may be very effective for our homeowners down in the reservation that, that eventually, if we're gonna move some people around to help them get out from our industrial buffer. Uh, the, the idea behind the program is a nonprofit board, excuse me, a nonprofit board uh, will own, let's say, a $50,000 house with land on it. What they do is they keep title to the land and they sell you the house. So even though I'm taking your $25,000 house over here and this one's $50,000, I'm basically gonna buy you out in a way that you can afford to buy the $50,000 house, but we're gonna, excuse me, we're still gonna own the land and you're gonna own the house. And the idea would be, again, you have to take you have to show that you could keep it up. You have to take classes that you can keep, you know, there are programs, but it's, it's taken really low income people and given them a way to upgrade their housing in a way that they can still afford to do it. And so again, I think it's something we should look at, but it's gonna depend on which neighborhoods and how we think we would do that. But it might be, we talked, we joked several times about the, the little old widow that won't leave her house. Well, if she's got a $50,000 house that's fallen down around her, maybe I can give her a nicer, smaller house that she can afford, even though it's more expensive, but the land cooperative owns the land under it, so you know she's only paying for 60% of whatever that value is of that property. That's the style of how that works. Something we should look at for certain situations, especially if we're trying around the buffer to help some people that we want to stay, help them make a good choice, help them move to a place they can afford. Um, and other communities have renovation programs. You buy any house in this neighborhood and you get $15,000 for renovation costs. And some strings on how you spend it. You have to use a contractor, you have to whatever. I mean, there, there's some logic to it, but the idea would be we want you to move into this neighborhood and anybody that buys one of those 80 to 100 year old houses that needs some work to it, if you buy a house in this neighborhood, you automatically get $15,000 towards renovations, something like that. So those are all types of things that we can do uh, along with Dickie, we were talking about building, he, he keeps twisting my arm to build new homes on his vacant lots. That's obviously another way we can increase home ownership is take those vacant lots, infill a house on it, put some, if, you know, if we own it, we might put some deed restrictions, it has to be homeowner, can't turn into a rental, maybe. Again, those are things we talk about and put together as part of the bigger policy. But those are ways that we can start to get that 63 to, to go, we, Ryan adds homes and that helps. Fisher adds homes down in Renaissance and it helps. Um, you know, your, your condos over there that we're trying to get going, 36, 34, whatever it is, they're owned, dumped. Around the buffer, we start removing rentals and, and you just start torquing it with the idea that we start get to 60, we get to 60, we go to 65, we get to 65, maybe we do try to go to 70. Or maybe we think, you know what, the neighborhoods are strong again. This is good. We're fine. But you know, now we have something to think about and talk about while we're doing this. So go ahead. And then I'm going to come back to you as we get to the end of this, not tonight, but as we start getting into a neighborhood and talk about what are the impacts of all of this. Um, because if we start torquing neighborhoods, I'm going to change the character of some of those neighborhoods. And I'm not sure I'm going to know what that is. And so, go ahead, please. Let me throw, and I'm gonna be politically incorrect and just bear with me. We go into a predominantly African American neighborhood and I put in teachers and hospital and this, and all of a sudden 40% of the people moving in are 25 to 30 year old Caucasians. And the property values go up and three or four things change, and all of a sudden that neighborhood is starting to change. And forgive me for being politically incorrect, but I'm talking about, yeah, so is that a good thing? And they're homeowners. We said we wanted that. But that's the kind of thing when we get 
a little further down and we start talking about how we would actually redevelop a neighborhood, I'm gonna come back to you and go, okay, here's how we can increase home ownership, but in this neighborhood, is that a good thing? Um, how would we do that? It, what do you all think? And that's where we're gonna get the actual neighborhood involved and talk to them about, I can do this, I can fill these homes with homeowners, I can't probably control who the homeowners are. I can give, in, yeah, I can control incentives, I can, you know, I can recruit an engineer, I can recruit a teacher, I can recruit an artist, I can recruit a college graduate like Hamilton, I can do all these different things, but I don't know who's coming. And so if I build these houses and I fill the empty houses and we do these things, that neighborhood may change. Now I can put property tax abatements in, and, and the mayor and I have talked about, I've talked to council about that, that if we go into a neighborhood and all of a sudden property values start going up because we're doing great things. Streets are paved, gateways, parks are renovated, and everything starts up 20, 25%. I can put a CRA area in and abate property taxes for, I can do it up to 10 years. And so I can protect you from that, but I won't be able to control once this beast gets rolling, who's coming? Once we say this is how we're going to do it, I won't be able to control who's coming. Other than there'll be engineers or teachers or whatever it is we're going to do. It's illegal. Right, right. I can if I put the program in place, everybody, everybody gets to use it. You know. But at the same time, what's going on now is bad. Had a significant negative impact on the neighborhood. Absolutely. They're not able to control that either. Yes. They're not in a position to go to the sheriff's sale or go to wherever and buy short or do any of the other stuff. Well, in these 48% rentals, he can't, he can screen based on criminal activity, he can, but you know, he can't, he has very limited control over who he can rent to, some, some control, but. Yeah, without the, what, the problem. But if you show up and you have no criminal activity and you got a deposit and you, you know, you do, you're, you, have, you, have, and you do a credit check and it's fine that he's gonna get harder and harder for him to say no and so again, yeah, we're having that issue in a different way now. And so again, I, I don't have an answer tonight and I'm not asking for an answer tonight, but eventually, you know, a month or two from now, when we start talking about, this is the neighborhood we're gonna look at and we know which houses are empty, which house, which vacant lots are there. And then we're gonna go, if we use these things, are we all in agreement, or at least most of us in agreement that we'll work through the changes of whatever that does to us with the idea that it's going to be better, but it's probably going to be different. And, and we don't, I'm not sure what different looks like. And I don't think, you know, we won't be able to know what different looks like. So I think that's the end of it, isn't it? Yeah. That's the end of it was trying to just start talking about home ownership. Cause I, and I hope you see my, yes, sir. R truly pick it up on, yeah, yeah and crank it across. You do that a lot, but. It, some, um, and especially more with like historic houses, things, you know, cookie cutter, you know, 1940s, post-World War II, probably not. You know, we just knock that down at the, when the time comes. But some of our nice older historic stuff that's 80 to 100 years old, again, maybe. Um, but I hope you're starting to see as we, we, you know, we've been through tax delinquent, we've been through vacant property, we've been through vacant residential land, property compliance or maintenance code compliance, the buffer, home ownership. Now we're gonna go to rental at the next one that uh, they're all starting to tie back to in some way. And so the idea is once we get the eight or nine global things, when we see one of these, generally this is what we're gonna do with it. Then when we get to the neighborhood and we go, first of all, I'm gonna ask you, which neighborhood should we look at? And then if we can figure that out, I'm gonna say, okay, here's the neighborhood. There's 700 houses in this neighborhood. And I know where the vacant lots are. I know where the vacant houses are. I know where all the things we've been talking about. I know where the tax delinquent properties are. I know where all of that is. Now let's talk about how this all ties together. We know we want more home ownership. Well, this, this neighborhood's at 50% not 53, so we're gonna to have to do even a little more to get home ownership up in this neighborhood. 
we have more vacant lots. Okay, that gives us a chance to do more infill construction. That helps. But you see how this is all starting to tie together. And that's the idea is, is as we get through each of these big topics, rental, home ownership, all this stuff, as then we start getting down to the micro level, down at the neighborhood level, we can go in and have some, because now that we've thought through each one of these, now when we look at 700 homes and we know there are 45 tax delinquent properties, there are 30 vacant lots, there are 25 vacant homes, there are, picking numbers out of the air, 30 that have severe property maintenance problems. Okay, now, knowing what we've talked about these last few months, how do we start attacking this to reduce rentals, to put our buffer in place, to increase home ownership, to get them all back property maintenance code compliant, to create gateways and renovate the park, to all that stuff. And that's kind of where we're trying, that's, that's why we're trying to lead through each of these areas so that, again, like I said, two or three months from now as we get to the, to the neighborhood, we've already had some really good discussions about how we would handle different types of things. Then when we see them, you always have the ability to say, let's make an exception on this one. Absolutely. But we know that most of the time when we see a vacant lot, if it's buildable, we're probably going to want to put a house back on it. Or we're going to have to mow it forever. Or if we're not going to put a house on it, what are we doing with it? Because I don't want to mow it for the next 40 years. We're going to make a park out of it? We're going to what? Walking trail? Split the lot? Whatever. What are we going to do with that one? And that's kind of where we're trying to go with all this. So, you know, given the, the you know, I, if you guys are okay, I'll start with 63 as our homeownership goal. That's the U.S. I mean, that's a good, that's the lowest of the upper ones. Um, I'll incorporate that into our rental at the next one. If we're doing that, here's what's going on with our rentals. Here's what's going on. We said we wanted to do this with homeownership. I'll start talking to you a little bit about how we might talk about moving some of those around. There are incentives out there where you can buy out landlords. If you have a certain style of property in a certain neighborhood, I'll, I'll give you a market rate plus 10,000 to walk away. And I'm gonna turn that back, back around and turn it into a homeowner. Again, if that's what we think we should be doing. Those are the types of things we can do almost anything. We're the ones making the policy. It's a good place to start. I think so too. I, and again, if we could hit that, how cool. Let's move on. Maybe we, again, or maybe only in certain neighborhoods do we want to, these neighborhoods are all getting stable, but this one's still struggling. Let's, let's do something special over here in some way. So that's all I had. I just wanted to talk about home ownership and I'm, I'm grateful for your time as always. And anything you guys want to talk about? Yeah. Is the goal that we're you're sort of setting this all up that at the very end we start doing a recommendation? Yes. And the idea is, you know, and I've showed this a couple of times, and I don't know if you've seen it in any of the present, but the, I pull up the 1963 master plan, and it showed the dilapidated and deteriorated neighborhoods, and I and I showed everybody it's like it's the exact same neighborhoods. <laughs> Fifty-five years. I, 63 was the year I was born. I'm 55 years old. For 55 years, we've looked at this and said it's a problem and we haven't fixed it. So if those represent seven neighborhoods, if you fix two, now you only got five problem neighborhoods. You fix three, now you only got four problem neighborhoods. In theory, you keep working, chipping away, but you actually fix the neighborhood. You lift it up, you pave the streets, you get the sidewalks, you fix the alleys, you deal with the home ownership and the property maintenance and the vacant land and the vacant homes and the and the idea, okay, this neighborhood's stable. The homeowners are engaged again. We got all these things going well. Let's go on to another neighborhood. And that's the idea is to build a five to 10, 15 year policy of this is how we're going to start bringing those seven neighborhoods back up. Because honestly, if you did that, what would happen to crime if our troubled neighborhoods all got lifted up? My guess is we would look a lot like, you know, Kettering or some, you know, that has, still has older stuff, but doesn't have nearly the problems that we have had over the years. So that's, what, that's where we're trying to head. And the idea is, again, if we know what we're doing with vacant land and we know what we're doing with code enforcement, we know what we're doing with all the pieces, then when I get this neighborhood of 700 houses, we have a pretty good idea 
of what we should be doing with anything that doesn't already, that's not already in a healthy place. Okay, another question. Yeah. How long did I sign up for? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is probably realistically, I could see this taking another four months just because of the, of the nature of what we're doing. Now I have, and one of the things I said at the beginning is if we could get to the place where it looks like this, and now we gotta go execute, I would love to have this group meet twice a year or once a year and say, okay, we, last year we said we were gonna do this and we got this much done. I'm thinking next year we should do this. Do y'all you you all still on board? Are we, do you think I'm still doing the right thing? In other words, I would like to keep this group intact whether it's once or twice a year and say, this is what we said, this is what I've done. Do we all think I'm still on the right track? Are we heading into place? To, is it doing what we thought? We tried to lift this neighborhood up. Did it, did it work? And continue, but I would love to have this group, you know, a year, once, even if it was once a year. Okay. We're getting ready to do the budget and this is what we've gotten done. This is what I was gonna do next year for the budget. Do y'all still think I'm on the right track? That's the style. Um, I'll tell you, here, is this extra? Thank you. Um, I hate them, but people keep buying so much from them That's true. that they keep trying to build more and I keep trying to swat them away a little bit. But the problem is every time they build one, it makes it darn much money. They're like, hey, we need two more in Middletown. And I've, I've, we've shut down a few with zoning that we were able to go, nope, we won't let you do it. Um, but the answer is they're making so darn much money, it, it's very lucrative for them to be here. And as long as people, it's kind of like Walmart, you know, if everybody's gonna go to Walmart and pay the, you know, roll back prices, then the, well, the local hardware store back. is gonna have trouble staying in business. Their model must have, well, I know it does, it's the demographics about it to the point that it's yeah. feeding to a lot of people that don't have motive or. The food business, the people who also want to transportation. Oh, they got the whole deal. But. I can but, walk and get eggs. Walk, right. That's it. I can, I that's can get, I, I, can, and, I can go get some eggs and some milk, and I could actually walk home if I didn't have transportation. It's replacing the mom and dad. Yes. And. Yeah. Looks like it's the second October meeting is going to be. No, I'm sorry, be the first November meeting. We're gonna get into neighborhood infrastructure, nuts and bolts of sidewalks, and, but the second one's going to be, what else makes a neighborhood? What, what about the health of the neighborhood? What about food deserts? What about, and I've got energy efficiency, Wi-Fi access, I've got, and I got a stack of this stuff like this that I haven't gotten that far into PowerPoint, but I've got it all gathered of things that need to be able, because yeah, there's a big, now save a lot closed down there, there's nothing in the south end. I mean, Mar the old marsh is now, Very yeah, is now the, the closest grocery, if I remember right. It may be Ingalls Corner, but yeah. Are we doing anything to attract new businesses? <sighs> we will, but again, I, we gotta try to, if, the thing about retail, retail is really weird. And we spent a fair amount of time in the last two or three years starting to learn more because we weren't very good at it. And, uh, like Starbucks, uh, if, if you want a Starbucks in Middletown, Starbucks has 10 things that they have to have. And what they know is if they have every single one of these 10 things, the store is guaranteed to be profitable. And it's, some of them are logical, you know, so many traffic within so much things, so much demographics on money and how much family income. And, but some of them are not and we started looking at some of their models and um, I'm making this up, but I've seen things where like, if p at least 30% of the people need to drive a foreign car. That like intuitively, how does, what does that have to do with coffee? Um, but they've got these things and they have learned that if you have this characteristic that you are likely to pay more for coffee and therefore, and anyway. And so what we've, when we sit and talk to Starbucks, what they tell us is, 
You have eight. We're never coming. Ever. Yeah, but we got eight of the ten. We don't do eight of the ten because I have locations all over the country that have ten. And I know they'll be profitable. If you have nine, we're never coming. Ever. And so can we bring Target back? No. I can't. Because I don't have the demographics that they're looking I don't have the ten things that they're looking for. And it is literally that. They will look at you and go, uh, no, never. Never. And it, I mean, they're very, they're polite, but they're very blunt. No, we will never do that, ever. Just out of curiosity, whatever happened with the, with the, the mall out there? I mean, you know, there were so many stories where they were going to make it an outdoor mall, then they were going to do this, and they were going to do this, and, and it's still nothing. It is still nothing. Uh, the guy that owns it is an Egyptian who lives in California. Hmm. I haven't seen him in at least six months in town. And so uh, my guess is it sits there for a while because I don't think he's motivated to do anything with it. I think this is a loss. He has a number of places. I think this is one of them that helps balance his balance sheet. Yeah, this is a loss leader for him. Mm -hmm. Yep. It works for his balance sheet. Doesn't do much for Middletown. Nothing good. Wasn't somebody going to buy it at one time? And Manchester? I didn't hear it. In Manchester? Yeah, wasn't somebody going to purchase it and make it a, another hotel? Or? That, was the, that was the hope, yes. But that fell down the drain as well? Yeah. Yeah. Just because the cost of it? Or? Yeah, it's a 12 to $14 million renovation. And you know, it's, it, that's a tough project. How do you convince people if you put $12 million into that hotel, you can break even. Right. I mean, if you, yeah, what, what kind of, yeah, occupancy do you I have to have? It, right. So, so at what point do we, you know, who owns it? The city owns it? Yeah. A uh, guy out of Chicago owns it. So at what point do, I mean, do we just continue to let it be a, we're working on stuff, but I can't get into the details. We have some, we sold it to the guy in Chicago. We've got some contingencies in the contract that we are probably going to activate here in the next few months. What about the Sorg Mansion and the restaurant for folks going in? Uh, the Sorg Mansion has had, gosh, already two and a half million dollars put into it. They have done a beautiful job with the renovations. I was in it probably 10 months ago. Uh, ladies out of it, I can't remember, it's either Massachusetts or Maryland. She's also involved in something else. And now she's now, she's now moved here and she's now the head of the Middletown Community Foundation. She's the new director. Uh, they, they are going to finish the renovation and turn that into a bed and breakfast. Uh, we have had very little success working with the Sorg Opera people. Um, I like them, but they're, they're very artsy. They don't have much business sense to them. And we keep talking to them about renovating the commercial side so that they, they, then they can go to the bank and say, we have cash flow, help us renovate the theater so then we can do, and they go, we don't care about the commercial side. We, was, we just wanna have beautiful concerts. I go, there's no bank in the world that's gonna bankroll your beautiful concerts. Um, and that's the discussion we've had about every six months for three years. That's not our dream. You're just, city, just leave us alone. All right, to meet your building. But it's not gonna develop until I you do something. The, the old, the road, the, uh, the one on Main Street that just, the roof is gone. And it's yeah. Like, it's, the two, it's between two infrastructure. That, so do we just keep the facade there? Or? For the moment, um, Steve Kuhn, who's gonna do the Getz Tower, the What's the, is that the gothic looking, the one that goes up like that uh, on the corner of Main and Central? You know what I'm talking about? On the, the Fifth Third, where Fifth Third Bank is. Um, and I don't know if, if I... He's going to turn that into 16 uh, luxury apartments. Okay. And it was supposed to be done by now, but 
I got a call. Did I tell you? Did I tell you that story? Okay. I get a call last January, and someone goes, "The outside of that building looks a little weird. Maybe you should check it out." And I'm like, oh, "It's like negative seven out." And I'm like, oh, "Shit!" So I go over there, and it's like there's weird ice on the outside of the building. I went, "That is weird." So I open the door, and as I walk in, there's an elevator, like right here. There is water shooting out of every seam of the elevator. <laughs> Under pressure, a lot of pressure. I'm like, that ain't good. And so I go back out into the lobby, and it's raining in the lobby. So I go, we got a leak somewhere. So I start over to the stairs, and I'm not joking. There's three inches of water doing this in a river down the stairs. And then I'm sitting there, because I literally like threw on a pair of jeans and a, actually it was these shoes, a pair of loafers. And I'm like, I'm getting wet. <laughs> so I tramps up. It was on the fourth floor. The pipe that they used for the fire suppression, six inch pipe, had exploded and blew a hole in the wall this big. And it was literally geysering out like this big <laughs> with water. And then it had been running for three days. Ooh. Five foot of water in the basement. So I called water and I said, come over and turn the pipe off. So they had to get all that pumped out. They had to get all that done. Well, that building's plaster because of its age, not drywall. So there's $600,000 worth of plaster damage. And as they're trying to dry the building out, it's just not drying out. And so what we find like a month and a half later is, I don't know if you remember, there are like 50 foot ceilings in that. Well, up above there is a mezzanine for HVAC and it's got a trough to catch any condensate so it doesn't leak. It's full of three feet of water that they didn't know because it was all covered. So then they had to find that, pump all that out, get the fan and the heaters back in, finish drying out the building. Then the insurance said, we're not sure we want to pay for that. So here we are in September after January, so it's been eight, nine months now, still fighting with the insurance company. So the theory is insurance pays, they finally get it under construction, 16 luxury apartments. Steve's gonna, what, what Steve wants to do is put a brewery in the old Rose furniture. And he said, what I'll do is I'll get the great big distilling, the big distilling equipment, bring it in and set it. Then I'll build the rest of the building around it since I got an open area. So that's what he would like to do with it, but we gotta get the, got to get the apartments done first. So that's my long-winded story. That's a lot. Yeah. A lot. It, would, it just uh, couldn't have been any crappier trying to get that thing. What, I mean, it should have been. He had already done the demo. It was ready to start construction until we filled the entire building with damp plaster. One thing I'll break ground on those uh, that we talked the last time, that you know, condominiums or right. I, I have not heard. Uh, it's been through zoning. It's been through council. I think we have plans, but I have not heard a start date yet. Uh, I know they've been over there kind of clearing out the houses and clearing out the apartments. I think they've done some. Looks like they did some demo to the house. Yeah, so, some demo work and cleanup work, but I don't, I don't, I haven't heard. I'm sorry. I don't know that one yet. Anything else tonight? I am very grateful for your time as always. And I, again, I, I hope as we get to the end of this, we've had such good discussions that I think we're gonna have a really cool policy. I think, I think it'll work. So thank you all, have a good night and I really appreciate it.